thank you so much to everyone who has uh, taken time out of their Saturday today to join in on this presentation that uh, I'll be giving with my collaborator, Stephen Kelly. And uh, I'm here in Annapolis Royal, which um, for those of you who are not as familiar with Nova Scotia, it is a beautiful little town by the sea. And uh, it is, I've been really lucky to spend a week here as part of an artist residency. And uh, it's through um, Arts Place, which is a contemporary art center and artist run center that's run through the Annapolis Region Community Arts Council. A really fantastic organization who um, I'm, I've been involved with over the years in different capacities. And so just first of all, I would like to really acknowledge their support for this project and for bringing me here to Annapolis Royal and for giving me space to explore and to create. And, uh, and I'll extend that out to artist run centers everywhere because uh, they're, they're just so important for artists to be able to take some risks and to play around with ideas and to do some experimentation. And uh, Martha Cooley, whose space I'm looking at right now up on the top bar, is someone who uh, has been running an artist run center, a film co-op in Halifax for years. So she very much knows the importance of uh, just being given the time and space to be able to play and, and do stuff. So um, thanks so much also to everyone here at RCAC who has uh, been just so helpful. Uh, Sophie Paskins, who is the, uh, the director of the center, uh, also Ted Lind and Dylan Tonkin, who have been helpful in many ways, as well as helping to set up this Zoom call. And, uh, and of course, also a big thanks to the Canada Council for the Arts, who uh, supports this organization, but also um, has been uh, supporting me uh, on this project. And, uh, and so it's, you know, without the Canada Council, it would be uh, very difficult to be able to take some of these artistic risks and to do some of this experimentation. So I'm just really grateful to get that support and, uh, and to just live here in Canada where we have something like the Canada Council. So um, I'll just start off by, uh, again, thanking all of you for coming today. It's a Saturday and, uh, and so I know Saturdays are precious, so it's it's really kind of you to to show up today and be part of the audience. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll start by just giving a little bit of a background about my project, and uh, and maybe first I'll give you an overview of what this talk will uh, look like um, for today. And uh, it will go for about an hour unless there's a lot of burning questions. And, uh, and in that case, we'll, of course, extend it. But um, I don't want to take uh, too much of your time. So I think probably will we'll be about an hour. And uh, what I'll do is I'll start by giving a little bit of information about the project and some background and how it kind of got started. And then I'll invite Stephen uh, to talk a little bit about uh, his role in the project and how we've collaborated. But maybe before we jump into that, um, we'll just start with a, a brief introduction. Um, I'll introduce myself and Stephen can introduce himself and then we'll, uh, we'll start talking about the project. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I think I know many of you who are here with me today, um, but for those who I don't know, uh, my name is Erin Foster. I am an artist and I live in Halifax and uh, I do a bunch of different stuff, uh, much of which is involved with uh, community groups and organizations and I teach part-time at NASCAD University and I, uh, I've spent time living in a bunch of different places but I call Nova Scotia home and uh, and so, yes, I live, I live in Halifax and, uh, and I'm here today to chat with you. And so, Stephen, would you like to give a, an introduction uh, quickly about yourself? Sure, so my name's Stephen Kelly. Um, I'm a musician and an artist and a computer programmer. Um, I went to NASCAD uh, and did a BFA there. And then after that, I studied computer science at Dalhousie and eventually earned a PhD in computer science. And since then, I've been working as a postdoc at Michigan State University at the Beacon Center for the Study of Evolution in Action. So that's a research center where um, we focus on cross-disciplinary research, um, all looking at different aspects of evolution. So we have evolutionary biologists 
and computer scientists and engineers all thinking about different ways um, we can use um, insights from evolution, from biological evolution, both to better solve problems in the real world, but also to learn more about the natural world. Um, so I do that and also maintain an art practice. And I just started um, a six month stint as a visiting research scientist at Google Brain. Thanks, Stephen. And we'll hear a little bit more about Stephen's uh, practice as an artist and scientist as we get a little bit more deep into this presentation. So yeah, what I wanted to first talk about was uh, the background for this project. So uh, for several years now, uh, I've been kind of getting back into having a studio practice. There were a number of years where I, I didn't have a studio space and where I was just kind of a lot more uh, nomadic, uh, living in all kinds of different places. So my, my artistic practice really was a reflection of that. So at the time, for a number of years, when I was also working as an administrator and, and doing a lot of office work, um, much of my practice was not studio based. So I was creating a lot of events and, uh, and I would say I would describe my work for quite a while as being sort of within the realm of social practice and also curatorial practice. And uh, in the last number of years, as I've been, I guess, getting a little more grounded uh, in Halifax, uh, I've also managed to uh, get a studio space, which has been very transformative and, uh, and also has allowed me to get back to really having a material practice combined with uh, a practice that is often, um, I guess you could call it conceptual, or I, I often like to just think of it as being driven by ideas. And so, uh, a few years ago, I, I got back into making photography again, and that is where I first studied at, when I did my undergrad at Concordia. Um, I was always really interested in alternative um, practices in photography and analog practices, and always just being kind of amazed at the magic that can happen in the in the dark room using um, image making in in the most um, kind of primitive of ways, where uh, instead of using negatives. Um, you can actually create images by making the negatives yourself. And so um, a few years ago, I started playing around with this idea of um, making these contact prints, which actually were sort of the result of these drawings that I was creating using uh, ink on pieces of glass. And the way that I would play with the ink, it would kind of create these blobby like images. And because of my background in photography, I, I knew that it could be really interesting to translate that uh, type of image making into a photographic process. And so I started just by doing some experimenting in the darkroom and the resulting images were uh, almost, almost like these x-rays or they, they kind of reminded me of something perhaps from outer space, but the, the images I really started to see in them really were reminiscent to me of, of like very primitive looking organisms. And, uh, and so that, that sort of interest in these types of abstract shapes that were also reminiscent of organisms, but also reminiscent to me of all kinds of ab like what I call an, an abstract language that we see all around us. And they're not necessarily in things that are obvious to us, but when you start paying attention in nature, you kind of start to see these shapes and these, um, these images peeking up in all kinds of places, often as, as in between things. And, uh, and so I spent uh, a number of years just kind of playing with these images. And as I was creating them, I started to think, um, you know, with this, this notion of them almost functioning as a kind of taxonomy of, of a set of organisms, uh, I, I began to wonder what, what might happen if I could actually evolve these these images into something um, that could potentially even move into the realm of three dimensions. And what if I thought about these organisms as also being kind of like these seeds for world building? And so at that point, I started thinking a lot about the making of the universe and uh, and also just some of the the theories of course that um, we we think about as we think about the origins of the universe and and what were those original 
tiny little organisms, those proto-organisms that gave birth to everything that we see around us now, all the shapes, all the structures, all the things, the landscapes within this world. And so I thought, what if I could take these, um, these things that I'm creating and actually uh, do something with them where they can become like these um, building blocks for some kind of a propositional world. And so maybe what I'll do is I'll just start by sharing a few of those images now before I hop into um, where, where some of those experiments went. I'm just going to share my screen and you can let me know if you can see everything okay. Um, yeah. Great. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Great. <laughs> So, um, so I'm just starting off with an, uh, an image from the gallery. For those of you who are not here in Annapolis Royal, you can get a sense of what the installation looks like. And, uh, and so on this wall where you see the yellow background, this is um, a series of those, those images I was just telling you about. So this is a sampling, and I think there's about 90 images here. And, uh, and I think I have around... 250 of these that I've created in total. And so um, I really do think of them as this like taxonomy or this collection. And I've, I've also grown quite fond of certain ones as if they're kind of like these children of mine. Um, so here's a, another uh, angle where you can kind of see how they are each very different, almost like snowflakes or other types of things that we might categorize. Um, but also they're each very unique. And the, the thing that I find really interesting about the making of these images is that they're, they're all kind of made in more or less the same way where I'm just really dripping ink onto a sheet of glass. And depending on the conditions that, that might change and it could be the velocity of how quickly the ink uh, lands on the glass or it could be the, the way in which I'm, I'm sort of uh, moving the glass around, it, it alters the, the shape and the kind of um, the image that we see. So you can tell they're all kind of related, but at the same time, they're all very different. And I also look at these images and when I was making them, I realized that I've actually had quite an obsession with, with these types of images for quite a long time. And I'm only just noticing that uh, these, these types of organic shapes are, are keep coming up in my practice in, in different ways that I've been working. So um, I'll just show you some more individual examples here. And uh, some, some people have mentioned how it almost looks like it could be uh, an x-ray of a bone um, or, you know, some sort of, uh, sec so some sort of microscopic image um, of, of something um, very uh, small and almost um, impossible to see with the naked eye. Um, you can see some of them have these like almost fuzzy little sides and, and almost like a nucleus or um, for those of you who might be more familiar with biology, um, you may see some things that do look like a lot of common types of cells or organisms. And, and there's also, I think, something a little bit outer spacey about them as well. Um, so I'm just going to, let me see, what's the next one? Oh yes, so um, I'm just going to stop sharing right now. Let me see, where did my cursor go? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, just um, moving from there. So that gives you a little bit of a background on the images that I've been working with. And so as I was thinking about this idea of evolution and, and also this idea of translating um, potentially these images from 2D into 3D, it, it just made me start to think a lot about how often in in art and in and just like regular um things that we do we we usually think about things that are in the three-dimensional world that we're rendering into two dimensions as paintings or as photographs but it's not very often that we start with something two-dimensional and then translate it into something three-dimensional um, with, with the exception of say something like architecture so i've also been thinking a lot about this project as it relates to architecture and what it means to translate something that's flat and within two dimensions into something that is um, 
you know, within three dimensional space. And what that means as well to the way that we think about these things, because when we start with three dimensions, we understand what those three dimensions are when we bring it into two dimensions and we flatten it. So then we look at, at that flat two dimensional thing and we still understand it as a three dimensional object because of how we understand the world. Whereas when we take something two dimensional and we try and imagine how it functions in the three dimensional world, we don't have all that information unless we are able to map out that three dimensional information. And so that's kind of what got me thinking about the possibility of introducing computers and algorithms. And I started wondering, I wonder if I could like come up with a way to create an algorithm that could read these images and using its own kind of creative purpose, uh, find a way to translate those two dimensional uh, images into something that could then become three dimensional. And so it was through some conversations I started having with Stephen because I knew he was um, in computer science and uh, he's a long, uh, I've known Stephen a long time as a friend and uh, and I've always been really interested in the work that he does as an artist and as a scientist, computer scientist. And, uh, and I knew he was also exploring artificial life in the, in the projects that he was doing um, as part of his PhD research. So I, uh, I started just having some conversations and asking him, do you think this is possible? Like, are there some ways we could play with this? And, uh, and so he, I really, really appreciate um, Stephen's commitment to the project because um, it, it took quite a long time before we were able to actually get some uh, financial support to be able to push the project further. And, uh, and he's really stuck with me and really um, been a support of, of seeing this project uh, move to the next stage. And, uh, and of course, he's had some amazing ideas. And so um, I think we probably started talking about this more than three or four years ago. And, uh, and it's really just been, been within the last year that we've been able to take it to the next uh, level of, of collaboration. And so um, what we've been focused on in the last year is working together to think about, you know, what would, how would these algorithms be built? And, and also, what does it mean to start thinking about this project as it also relates to ideas in computer science and, uh, and also to artificial life, which is really a way, and, and I'm still very much trying to wrap my, my head around um, much of what happens in artificial life and artificial intelligence and a lot of what we see happening in these art and science collaborations now. But um, with artificial life, just looking at the way that we can better understand our natural world by simulating it and by creating versions of it. And that's ultimately what I've been wanting to do with this project is to do world building as a kind of simulation exercise to see if it also can teach me and can teach those who may be interested in my work about, um, about how, how potentially could the world have been created. And, um, and so I've also been really lucky to connect with um, another collaborator who's, um, whose name is, um, and I'm going to probably not say his last name right, but uh, Michael Reinstadter, who is a, a wonderful person who is also a physics professor at McMaster University and runs the Origin Institute there, which is a, a lab that studies the origins of the universe. And uh, I was supposed to do a residency there a little while ago, but due to um, COVID and just things not being able to happen, we've just been carrying on our conversations virtually with plans for me to go there in the near future. Um, but one of the things that Michael's been really great uh, to have conversations with is um, just talking about some of the real world questions that he's dealing with and, and then talking about the project that we're working on and what's been really exciting is to find out that a lot of what we're discovering and a lot of the work that we're making is actually very much in parallel to the things that he and many of his fellow scientists are interested in, as well as the weird thing being a lot of my images are very similar to the images that he's looking at that are actually from the things that uh, he's studying as it relates to the origins of the universe. So um, the next real phase of this project will be uh, for and Stephen actually is um, going to be starting working as a professor at McMaster next year, so or this year actually later in the summer. So 
um, now I've got these two amazing connections at Mac and hopefully within the next couple of years, we're going to really be able to put some more resources into uh, pushing this project forward. But uh, maybe before I get too far into talking about the future, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, what, what we've done as part of this um, kind of first phase of experimenting. So um, as Stephen and I have been playing around with this translation from 2D into 3D, we've, we've also been talking about, um, you know, what, what kind of makes sense in terms of how we set up this algorithm or how we play with this idea of um, creating fitness functions. And, and for those of you who are maybe not familiar with the computer lingo, as I am just starting to become acquainted myself, um, the fitness function is essentially the conditions that you give the algorithm so that it understands what, what reward it's, it's sort of working towards. And so one of the things that we've talked about is um, the reward of novelty. So how do you teach a computer to be creative? How, how can you teach a computer to essentially think on its own and make that reward something that is creative um, or something that is unique? And so th those are some of the ideas that we've been playing with. And Stephen will get a little more technical into the explanations of, of what he is doing and the ways in which he's uh, exploring this side of things. Um, but ultimately, we've been just trying to figure out how do we essentially assign the, the algorithm, the, the, the question of searching for ways to translate these images into three dimension and three dimensions that will, you know, start with those original images, but then take us on a path that could be quite interesting to see how these shapes might evolve from 2D into 3D. So I'll just bring up my... Um, my screen again and just share with you a few images um, from what we've been working away on. Okay, so what, let me see if, can I go back one image? So starting with this image again, this is organism number 10. And that's a very exciting title, I know. So organism number 10 is the test image that we've been working with to, to essentially evolve in a few different ways and to see how it might go from being this two-dimensional image into a three-dimensional object. And so Stephen's going to talk a little bit about his teapot approach when, when he hops on here. Um, but I'll just maybe start with uh, a few details of of what we did. So um, with the algorithm that was created, we took this image and essentially evolved it from this into, um, and I'll show you the some more examples of, of the what I call digital blueprints. Um, but we created a series of these blueprints, which you see above. So these are drawings and each of these drawings represent uh, an iteration of the evolution. Um, I think in this one, we did 78 iterations, and then we selected, I think it was maybe 12, that we would print out using a 3D printer. So um, what you see on the bottom are the, the sculptural printouts using a 3D printer, and then the two-dimensional uh, blueprint images. Uh, looking at it from one angle, we also created these blueprints so you could see the images from um, different a multitude of angles. and. Um, and so here are just some examples of what those digital blueprints look like. Um, and you can see how it's essentially evolving and, and adding pieces. And then, so there were two experiments that we did and I've separated them between yellow and cyan. And with, I've got, I think, five or six slides here that show the progression of these, of these images um, or of, these, um, of each of these iterations. And the top left, is the, where we start and then it will continue until um, where where we end and it's it's infinite we could keep evolving until the end of time so at some point we just decide we'll we'll stop it but ultimately these um these shapes could just continue evolving And I, oh, and there's um, a bit more of a close-up of one of the sculptures and another one there. So, um, and I'll just say 
we um, we're still really early on with the the actual um, rendering of the the sculptures into three dimensions. And our goal with this project in this phase was really just to try it out to see what it would mean to translate from two D into three D, and then to also just start being able to think about how could we then start using these models these small models to potentially make larger sculptures and potentially landscapes and and worlds that could be uh built by then bringing some of these um these these objects and images together that might start to fuse in the way that when we look at the origins of the universe um we see things that would begin to um fused together and uh, and then ultimately we see the, the making of, of the world around us. So um, I think this is probably a good place for me to pass the screen on to Stephen, who can jump sure. in and start to talk a little bit more about the uh, computer side of things. Sure, I'm gonna share my screen as well. So everyone can see that, the dark? Yep. Um, so in thinking about how we're going to create an automated way to translate the 2D images into 3D forms, I started thinking about how we perceive three dimensions in our everyday lives. So I came across this thought experiment um, by the researcher named Jeff Hawkins who talks about, he gives this idea of like, imagine you're in a completely dark room or space and you reach out to touch an object with your hand. And so you would kind of rub your fingers or hand around the object to feel it out. And as you do that, you're moving around and filling in more and more of the object in the dark. And eventually your brain or your imagination rather will just be able to fill in the rest without touching the rest of the object. And so I think really when we perceive three dimensions in the real world, it's mostly in our imagination based on our experience. So we're kind of predicting um, what the parts of the environment are that we can't directly perceive. And this is the way vision works as well. It's not just, it's every sense kind of works like this. We kind of have like a random scattershot sensation of the world and we fill in the rest. Um, and the important thing I think to note about this is that these representations are in time. They're not necessarily only in space. So another way to think about this data of the teapot in this case would be as a time series. So basically like a brainwave or a, a, a sequence of, of data in time essentially. And that's the way that I'm thinking about representing these 3D forms in the computer. So here we just have the X, Y, and Z sort of coordinate of a space along that teapot. So this is a representation of the teapot as a, as a waveform. And the next question is, so how do we translate, how do we use that idea to translate these images into 3D objects? And I think we can do it with something called an imagination machine. So essentially an imagination machine is a computer program that we're gonna create. And what this computer program does is it has a sensor that can scan a 2D image in a similar way to the way our eyes would sort of saccade around the image uh, when we see it. We're not sort of taking in the whole thing at once, but we're sort of randomly moving around the image. And the imagine nation machine does this and it outputs a waveform and then we can translate that waveform back into a three-dimensional object so the question now is how do we create that imagination machine one way to do it and if you are a really really talented programmer you could probably program this from scratch using um all kinds of like image processing techniques and 3D rendering techniques. But the way that we're gonna take um, is to actually evolve this computer program or algorithm from scratch. And this is um, 
what I've been focusing on my, in my research for the past few years, and this is what I'm focusing on um, at Google currently as well. So genetic programming, in a nutshell, is a way to get a computer to program itself using artificial evolution. So instead of writing a program from scratch, you start by initializing a population of random programs. So it's just random code, doesn't do anything useful. And the next stage in the process is what Aaron mentioned previously is a fitness evaluation. You need to have some way of ranking all of these random individuals um, based on the criteria of the search. So what we're looking for. So in our case, we're trying to evolve 3D forms. So what we can do is run each of these randomly generated imagination machines on the teapot and compare the waveform that they output to the waveform of the actual teapot. So I call this image of Aaron's the teapot just because it kind of reminds me uh, of a teapot, but we could think of any object here. But because this blob, organism 10, reminded me of the shape of the teapot, I chose the 3D form of a teapot as something to sort of encourage the evolution to strive towards. So initially, all these imagination machines will just, like I said, produce random output. But inevitably, if you generate a population of them, some of these waveforms will be closer to the 3D form of the teapot than others. So the next stage is to do some kind of selection. Select the ones that are closer to the 3D form that we're looking for. And from those selected, you can then apply mutation and crossover operators. So because these are computer programs, they're represented as just long binary numbers. So for example, to do a mutation, you would change a binary zero to a one and vice versa. And that would in turn create a change in the program's behavior. And likewise, to do to simulate like a sexual recombination of two different programs, you can take chunks of that binary code and swap it between two different algorithms. This process creates a new population, and then you return to the fitness evaluation and do it again. So iteratively, this process unfolds over many, many loops through this cycle, which I call a generation. And if you plot the fitness of the population over time, you see that it gets better and better through this sort of natural selection process inside the computer. So we ran this for, in this case, 80,000 cycles through that loop. And you notice that it's continuing to improve almost at a 45 degree angle. So like Aaron said, we sort of ran this, which this experiment took about 12 hours on Compute Canada, which is Canada's like um, supercomputer essentially. Um, and it's still nowhere near complete. It's, so it's a very open-ended kind of process, which could go on for much longer. And you know, we have no idea what would happen essentially. So if we look at the fitness, um, we can take the individual waveforms at each time point and see what kind of objects they create. And that's what we're seeing in the gallery and in some of these objects that we're showing in 3D form inside the computer and also inside the gallery. You see the evolution progressing. So the search is getting better and better at satisfying that fitness function which essentially is just becoming more and more three-dimensional. Because it's a random search, essentially, we're nowhere near actually mimicking the teapot exactly, but that really doesn't matter for our purposes. It's more about the search, the process. So sometimes it's small incremental changes, sometimes there's big changes. And that's what I wanted to share with you. Thanks. Oh, you're muted, Aaron. There we go. Steve, Stephen's done a really great job, uh, I think, explaining it in terms that we can all uh, understand. Because as you probably know, um, in the world of computer science, it can be hard to access a lot of these ideas and concepts. And so 
uh, I feel really grateful to be able to work with someone who uh, really understands art as an artist himself, but also someone who's really deep in this uh, science and really can kind of bridge these two worlds. And so um, what, what we're working towards doing next is continuing with the experimentations and also in the way that we'll be doing the three-dimensional printing as well. Ideally, what we'll be doing is also looking at um, different ways that we can print with different types of materials. And what I would really like to be able to do is work with um, materials that might have been available um, in, in that time of evolution, uh, early evolution. So thinking about um, clay and earthen materials that um, are very basic. And so uh, what, what we're really hoping to do is uh, in the next phase of research is to continue playing with this idea of 2D to 3D uh, translations um, through this process. But also, uh, I just wanted to mention this other idea that's um, kind of a newish idea, and uh, and it's something that we're, we're quite excited about. But even just this idea of thinking about the original shapes in the universe, because um, when, when we were thinking about this notion of the teapot and having that as the, the thing that we're endeavoring towards to, to have this um, organism evolve to become like the shape of the teapot, uh, it got us thinking about, well, when we think back to the, the, early, the early moments of the universe um, starting to evolve itself, there, there must have been these also these original shapes that would have been there to encourage different types of physical evolution. And so this is one of the conversations we're having with Michael right now at the Origins Institute is really thinking about um, what, what are these essential shapes that, um, that exist potentially in the world and how might that even relate to things like fractals and, um, and all kinds of like beautiful math that we often see artists playing with and thinking about. And, uh, and so I, in many ways, I feel like we're really at the beginning of this project. Um, and it feels like we have a lot of experimenting left to do, but, um, but I'm really, uh, I'm just so excited about it. And it's really exciting to be able to collaborate and, uh, and to have the opportunity to, um, to be able to, you know, bridge science and art together as a way to expand our, our own creative knowledge and our own scientific knowledge. Stephen, was there anything else you would like to add? Um, no, not necessarily. I'd be interested in questions, I guess, and I can add stuff if it doesn't come up. Perfect. So I think we can either, um, we can take questions in the chat, or if, if anyone would like to ask a question um, using their voice, um, you could just unmute yourself and uh, we would be happy to respond. I see one question in the chat just for me about the researcher that I mentioned. His name is Jeff Hawkins and uh, he wrote a really nice book called On Intelligence that is a really, um, I, in my mind, accessible but also like scientifically rigorous approach to thinking about um, what intelligence is. And Susan's asked, have you thought about using LIDAR? Uh, I haven't had the, I've just heard about LIDAR. Uh, I'm sort of behind in some technologies, but Stephen, have you had any experience working with LIDAR? I've, I have thought about it, um, especially because a lot of the new cell phones have LiDAR um, sensors in them. So you can do like um, 3D scanning with your cell phone, which then mm -hmm. can be right in the phone translated to a 3D model and printed. Um, but uh, I haven't uh, really considered about yet how we could use it in this project. But it's a good observation. Mm -hmm. Erin, I have a question. Sure. And uh, from coming in to see the the ex the exhibition, um, and and hearing Stephen talk now, um, does you know the iterations in three dimension? Well, first of all, in the computer uh, renderings, and then in the three D, do they start with a single image, like one of your blobs, mm -hmm. a single one? So, for example, on the back wall, which image, which of the blobs did it start with? 
oh, well, actually, I realized that that blob isn't actually in the grid, um, but it's number 10. And I can bring that image up again uh, to show you which one it is. Um, and I didn't understand that fully when I first saw, saw the exhibition. Yes, no. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so this is number 10 here. Yeah, I, I found if, if you flip it upside down, it looks like a teapot. Kind of. Oh yeah, right. I've got it upside down. <laughs> but it's an interesting question, like the fact that, yeah, so this single image was the seed for the entire evolutionary algorithm. Um, yeah. So from this single Ingrid image, thousands and probably millions of little imagination machines were evolved that would evolve this image into all kinds of different shapes. So we could do the same process for all the other images, mm -hmm. yeah. but there's sort of this combinatorial sort of like explosion of information and data yeah. in doing that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good question. Mm -hmm. And similarly for the other wall, which we haven't seen, um, that would be, uh, do you, that would start with a single. Do you have the single image that that one started with, began with? Because you have the oh. walls, mm -hmm. you have the other. Yeah, walls. it's the it's the same uh, image, starting image. We just oh. did two different experiments. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. got it. Got it. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> Took me a while to get it sorted as well. Don't worry. <laughs> Susan. Hi, Erin. Uh, lovely to see you. Um, uh, I was just wondering when you were talking, Stephen, about your algorithm or the, the program and you talked about the natural selection portion, is that, so was that computer then did that did the natural selection? Yeah, that's why I had natural in quotes. Oh, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, there's randomness in that process as well. So, um, and there's many different ways to do that selection. Um, I guess the, what I would say is that um, that term is really critical rather than the more common phrase or the, or the mnemonic uh, survival of the fittest, because we know for sure that it's not survival of the fittest in nature. There's so much more that plays in um, to it. One thing being diversity, like just how important important population diversity is to successful evolutionary search is a really interesting research area. So as, as um, Aaron said, in solving problems with evolution, often you can forget about the problem. So forget about trying to search for something in particular and just search for diversity, just search for novelty in that population. And in doing that, if you have enough diversity, you'll eventually find the solution to the problem. Susan Took. Uh, what, if, what if you took something that actually existed, um, a small life form, and you scanned it, say, with a LIDAR, and then you fed that into the computer and saw how that might evolve the organism? Have you, have you played with real life <laughs> yeah well one of the things that i'm hoping to do when i eventually get to the origins institute is um, they've got some amazing uh technology there and machines that can do all kinds of wild things um using actual um organisms and and information that uh, i would never be able to get access to and so one of the things that i've been talking to michael about is uh playing around with, with some of those um, images and, and the data that he has to work with, as well as incorporating some of what I'm doing into his machines and vice versa. So I think once, once I get access to that lab and also just have the time to be able to really um, do some more collaborating with Stephen and with Michael, then we're going to be able to, I think, do exactly what you're talk of, talking about, which is start seeing where you know, our, our propositional organisms might start to really parallel what we're seeing in the real world and, and just kind of substituting things out to watch for those interesting parallels or not. 
And uh, this is so exciting, but <laughs> also to create, say, two of these organisms and have them yeah. interact. Yeah, with exactly. Whitening. Yeah. Yeah, there's, wow. there's sort of like these endless possibilities of things we can do. So uh, right now, it's really just a matter of us uh, trying to find the resources and, and time to be able to really work together to, to go in deep in this creative process. It's so great. Thank you. Oh, and Ted asks, um, what role does scale play in the evolution uh, of these forms? And, uh, and I would say, um, for the time being, I think uh, we're not as concerned with, with scale because we're just trying to, I think, work within what is doable with, with what we have to work with um, in terms of 3D printing. Uh, but ultimately, at some point, uh, we'd really love to be able to see what happens once we do some more of these generations of, of ev ev evolutions and then thinking about what this could look like on a much grander scale. And so this is where the not only are the organisms evolving, but the project itself is going to start to take on uh, more of a life as it's, of its own as it starts to kind of, uh, I guess, influence our own thinking. And, and that's what I'm often most interested in, in within my own art practice is when the thing that I'm doing starts to talk back to me and tell me things um, where, where it becomes really a conversation between um, myself as, as the maker, but then the things that I start to create and how they start to uh, kind of give some sort of information back to me that then becomes this interesting creative loop of working. Stephen, do you have a, also a response to that question? It's actually, a, it's something um, that I need to think more about, but the scale inside, like from a technical perspective, inside the process, the scale is kind of bounded in a box and, you know, it's an arbitrary um, size, but it is a bounded size. So we, one, we could also evolve the scale of that bounding box too, so that, you know, um, relative size could also become a more exact or a more prominent aspect of evolution. It's a really cool suggestion. Um, and, you know, you could also think about adding things to the fitness function, like a, like a, a cost for size because energy we know in biological evolution and in biological or organisms is a is a really valuable currency and presumably bigger animals would um, require more energy hmm. it's a cool it's a cool idea are there any other questions or comments susan no pressure has her hand up. oh susan um so is that where is the crossover between uh uh, bringing in living cells and putting them into an in infrastructure that that you can create. Um, I mean, there is some work with creating, you know, I've seen an ear, a human ear, or um, where I, I look at this and I see that kind of flowing along together that that creation of what you're doing and depending on the materials that you use and the um, you know the carbon based materials or whatever uh, I know this is kind of far out there but maybe you could comment on that <laughs> Stephen Stephen do you want to respond first yeah well if um, like like I would first say if you're interested in this kind of work the Artificial Life Conference is a great place uh, to find out more about it. And in that, that conference specifically brings together, you know, computer science and biologists, people studying um, sort of wet kind of biology, like you described. And it also has an art track. Um, so in my mind, to bring that kind of thing into this project would mean another collaborator who specializes in the wet kind of biology side of it, because it's definitely outside of my area of expertise, but I think that would just be another sort of like fertile angle, uh, con you know, input contribution to the project. 
Uh, there's someone at MSU where I where I worked, there's someone named Richard Lenski who does this long-term evolution experiment. So he actually has these organisms that, and it's like a, a, um, a population of organisms that have been evolving. I think it's probably 10 or 20 years now, mm. the same kind of experiment that's been going on that long and his, you know, different students come in and out and do various sort of analysis of what's going on. Um, so there is tons, I think it's a good point. There's tons of interesting work there. Any other uh, questions or comments? Well, a comment, again, I'm coming back to very, a basics, Erin, about the, the material that was mm. used uh, to render the three-dimensional uh, sculptures, really, they are sculptures. Um, and I know that, so a uh, comment about what material was used, mm. and I know that you envision, I know that um, there are other materials that you envision down the road for those three-dimensional pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the material that we had, we produced these sculptures with are um, just your sort of standard um, plastic that is used in a lot of 3D printers and also resin. So um, we we mostly just needed a way to uh, to be able to visualize how these would translate into the three dimensions. And so uh, what I'm hopeful is for is um, with with further uh, resources and funding moving forward, uh, we can hopefully work with um, some spaces that might have the technology so we can really do some more experimenting. And I know that there's probably some other residencies and places out there that um, can give us the opportunity to really play around with clays and um, different types of materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> You can tell I'm excited by this. <laughs> um, it's great. <laughs> so how about mutations that occur within your, within your projects? You must have some surprises. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, that's one of the, the things that we've talked about is, is this idea of things mutating and changing with within its own self so that sort of self changing self organizing self creation and and so that that's definitely something that we're really um we're really curious about because um that's where it's a surprise for us as well is when these mutations happen and so i you know for me from a creative standpoint i love I love it when things happen that you don't necessarily have any control of when it surprises you and it becomes something else. Stephen, what are you? What are some of your thoughts about that? No, I agree completely. I think that's sort of the root of why I am interested in this type of computer science research in general because it's so exciting to to set up the circumstances under which the computer will do something you didn't explicitly program it to do or something surprising or um, innovative. And I guess um, it's like Aaron mentioned that we did two experiments. And when we're setting up these experiments, you know, there's all kinds of parameters that you can input, like, like you can slightly tweak, say the probability of a mutation happening for each individual in each generation just slightly tweak it. And if you change it, then the whole thing rolls out completely differently. And everything, you know, all the objects look different, and it, so uh, it's almost endless in terms of the surprise, the, its capacity for surprise. <laughs> That's what I love about it. <laughs> um, and Susan asks, "What about density? The ink on glass gives some food to density. Can the algorithm also do this?" Yeah. Are you trying to speak? You're, you're muted, Susan. Oh. Yeah, I, I guess what I mean is, you know, it, within the forms, you can see that there's uh, darker places than others. It look very much like bone density, like you were saying there, Erin. And um, with the forms that were 3D, uh, they look, to my eye, not being there in the gallery, um, quite dense. Uh, can, can 3D, how, how 
can 3D printing also give a clue to density as well? Yeah, it can. Uh, but uh, I guess I, I'm not an expert enough on it to know exactly how it would be done. But inside the computer, um, in terms of the algorithm, um, the data is like, um, uh, like a point cloud. So like points in 3D space, like a, like just like a cloud. And then the process for making it a form is kind of like uh, wrapping that form with like a paper or like a saran wrap. So even though the point cloud may have variable density inside, it's not really captured in our current process of making a form because it's more about the exterior surface that is created. But maybe in the future, that's something that we could think about it depend if the 3D mm -hmm. printer could do it. Yeah, that's something we still have a lot of uh, interest in is just figuring out the possibilities of 3D printing. And I think we're seeing pretty much every day 3D printing evolving itself and the types of things that it's able to do and including like the scale in which you can do 3D printing. So um, it's kind of limitless in all sorts of ways in terms of like the things we're working with and, and in terms of like the scale that we'll eventually work with and then the materiality. So um, I think the, the interesting but the challenging thing will be as we move forward with this project is um, you know, deciding where our limitations will be so that we can have some sort of, um, I guess, depth to the way in which we're, we're pushing the experiments. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca says, when I see iterative design, it makes me think of applying it. I guess that's different from an art for art's sake approach. Have you considered applying some of the designs as they evolve as vessels, architectural tiling, et cetera? Good question. Do you, do you have a response to that, Stephen? I haven't considered it, but it is an interesting question. Yeah, so like practical applications for the evolved objects. There's, there's lots of um, cool examples of, of practical evolved objects. One famous one is an antenna. So like radio antennas are notoriously difficult to design. It's like, a ma it's like magic, how they work, and, and there's there's been experiments of evolving the shape of an antenna that gives the best uh, reception or the best transmission ability. And well, you can look at, you can Google search it, like just evolved antenna and you'll show it's like this crazy kind of looking met metallic structure. Um, huh. So yeah, practical applications are definitely another avenue. So. <laughs> I will mention um, there, there was a side project that I hope to get back to working on uh, once, once I have the ability to do so. Um, but uh, I, I also started working with people to build versions of these, um, of these organisms, having people build them um, using clay. So children, adults, artists, non-artists, with the idea of how, how do the humans uh, evolve this these images from 2d into 3d 3d in comparison to how the machines are doing it and so at some point i'm hoping to also have a series of sculptures that will be based on um on these hand building exercises that i've i've been doing with people as well and so if you stay tuned and uh and keep uh keep asking me questions um hopefully at some point in the future i'll also have uh, a show that will also um, give a presentation of, of that side of the experiment as well. Did I answer? I hope I didn't skip over anyone. Um, I think that's, oh, and uh, Ted's just asking uh, that, so everyone knows this, uh, this has been recorded and, uh, and it will be available for people to uh, view on demand if you want to send it to anyone or you want to watch it again. Um, it's uh, yeah, we'll have a recorded version of this talk as well. So um, thank you so much uh, to everyone again for coming out today. And thanks to everyone at Arts Place for uh, being my tech backup. I've got some, maybe I can just do a little spin around here. Got my tech team, <laughs> Dylan and Ted and Sophie's in the off back office. And 
I'll also just say for anyone looking for an amazing uh, experience and opportunity, you should apply to Arts Place. They're not currently in this very moment accepting proposals, but they will be soon. And you have the option to do a residency here. And it's just, it's a beautiful town and it's a really supportive community of people. And so I highly recommend uh, throwing in a proposal here because it's been a great opportunity to hang out in this lovely town. And uh, so thanks again, everyone. Thanks for listening.